The trampoline is working. What a great retort to the Russian space program as the dragon breathes life into NASA. The dragon has just completed all three critical steps of the Demo-2 mission with zest as we wait for more aggressive missions in the near future. While we wait, we are going to have Maxcom, Max von Neumann Communications, communicate why the capsule is called the dragon, who is Ripley, and some things you may not have thought to ask. Maxcom? Let's begin by saluting Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley for a successful trip to and from the space station. Step one was keeping their cool while the fireball of the Falcon launched them into space. Step two of three of the mission was docking with the space station. And step three was returning safely to Mother Earth. We also salute the two Astros for serving their country. Benkin is a veteran of the Air Force, and Hurley is a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. Hoorah! Semper Fidelis to Doug Hurley. As Joint Operations Commander, Benkin has completed the main part of his duties to reach the space station and to dock, whereas Hurley, as Commander, was responsible for landing and recovery. Lastly, on the topic of the astronauts, it is interesting to note that Hurley flew on the last space shuttle mission in July of 2011, the very last space shuttle to go up into space and return. So where did Dragon get its name? When that tiny eight meter capsule was hurled into space by that violent explosion that took place underneath them, I couldn't help but hear heavy metal music bouncing through my head. With that fierce and powerful nature taking place beneath the capsule, it seemed evident to me that this is why the capsule was named Dragon. Wrong. I'm not 100% sure, but Heidi had told me that Musk had named the capsule Dragon after Puff the Magic Dragon. Now many of you may have heard the incorrect interpretation about Puff that probably came out of the 1960s, but in, 20, uh, but in the 25th anniversary concert, Peter or Paul, I, I can't remember which of the two, one of those two singers put those rumors to sleep and told the audience that Puff the Magic Dragon was definitely about how young people, when they start to become adults, lose their imagination. When we are young, we believe we can do anything. In the song, the kid, Jackie Paper, plays with his pet dragon Puff until one day he grows up and Puff never roars again. Elon Musk named the capsule Dragon after Puff as a response to those who said his dream of space was impossible, that he couldn't do it. Good thing for humanity, he knows that if the feat is within the laws of physics and the belief is strong enough, then an idea is not impossible. And sure enough, he is making the improbable happen again and again all the time. Sometimes it's still hard to believe that there's a sports car flying through space with Starman strapped inside. Since we mentioned Starman, I better not fail to talk about Ripley. For those of you who do not know who Ripley is, she is the anthropomorphic test device, or ATD. She looks like an astronaut strapped into one of the seats of Dragon, which will ultimately carry seven Astros. And she's full of sensors that will indicate 
what live astronauts will feel when they actually go into space. Well, actually what you know Doug and Bob felt when they went into space. I believe her maiden voyage was on the Demo-1 mission. When asked by Heidi why they called her Ripley, I failed another quiz question. I said it must have been from that show, uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not. As it turns out, she is named after the character Ellen Ripley from the movie Alien. To touch back, Musk wasn't the first to seriously dream about conquering space travel. There were others who worked to make what seems to be impossible probable. One of those visionaries was Hermann Oberth. When I think of resistance from society, even the scientific community, I sometimes recall Oberth's 1922 proposed doctoral dissertation on rocket science. It was rejected as utopian. At this point, I want to make an interjection about mathematics. On this channel, we oftentimes learn or are learning about mathematics. I want to tie learning mathematics into having the belief that something is possible. If you're one of those people that, that don't feel math to be daunting, then ignore what I have to say. But if you feel math is tough for you, or you think you could never get it ever at all, then I'm speaking to you personally. First of all, you have to begin believing you can learn math as well as anyone else. It just takes practice slash patience and the right frame of mind. Anyway, we will discuss this in future videos. Just remember, don't lose faith and believe. Have confidence in the fact that doing math at high levels is nowhere near impossible. Okay, back to Hermann Oberth. Oberth's interest in rocketry was sparked in grade school when he read Jules Verne's From the Earth to the Moon, a book which he recalled reading five or six times. The young Oberth at that point discovered many of Verne's calculations were not simply fiction and that the very notion of interplanetary travel was not as fantastic as had been assumed by the scientific community. By 14 years old, he envisioned a liquid-fueled rocket and he continued to teach himself the mathematics he'd need to make space travel possible. In 1923, he wrote a 92-page work called Die Rakete zu den Planetenraumen, The Rocket into Planetary Space. Then, in 1929, he expanded the work into a 400-page book named Wege zur Raumschiffert, Ways to Spaceflight. Also in 1929, Oberth finally got an opportunity to static fire his liquid-fueled rocket motor. It ran briefly, which was good, since it didn't have a cooling system. Oberth, the father, or one of the fathers, of rocket science, was definitely a visionary. At one time, he expressed that he had made a conscious choice not to pursue his doctorate. He wrote, Never mind. I will prove that I am able to become a greater scientist than some of you, even without the title of doctor. My favorite quote of his was him saying, Our educational system is like an automobile which has strong rear lights, brightly illuminating the past, but looking forward, things are barely discernible. Obviously, Elon Musk has similar sentiments. In Hawthorne, Musk has created his own school called Ad Astra, Latin for Through Hardships to the Stars. The school curriculum includes artificial intelligence along with experimenting with a lot of applied science. There are no sports, music, or foreign languages. 
well, just coding languages. Foreign languages have been nixed because future language translators will be in real time. From battle bots to rockets, the sky is the limit. The children reportedly asked if they could incorporate flamethrowers and electromagnetic pulses into their robots. The school's answer was, yes, until you destroy the school. A school like this reminds me of when I was a kid and I would be reading Tom Swift while dreaming about the future. Musk is clear when he says, we must become a multi-planetary species. Musk, similar to Oberth, believes that it is unacceptable not to pursue becoming a space-faring civilization. As we discussed in the video, SpaceX and Elon Musk take a giant step toward a new and bold future in outer space, there will one day be a valedictorian speech on Mars at Musk High School, and the future graduating classes will be pushing the outer edges of the solar system. I just wish we would have pursued these ideas when Hermann Oberth had first envisioned them in the 1930s. Regardless, humans will colonize Mars. Before we take a look at where we are going, let's take a look as to how we got to where we are. We begin our journey with the first free flight that took place in Paris, 1783, in a hot air balloon made of paper and silk by the Montgolfier brothers. The next major step was the German inventor Otto Leontal's glider. Beginning in 1891, the heroic engineer had over five hours of logged flying time on his glider. All this from studying birds in flight. A little over a decade later, using much of Leontal's engineering principles, the Wright brothers added some control features along with an engine to become the first powered flight in December of 1903, four miles south of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Finally, in 1939 in Germany, the first jet aircraft, the Heinkel HE-178 V1, flew into the history books. The next milestone was Yuri Gregarin becoming the first human to enter space in 1961 on the Vostok 1. And finally, Apollo 11 left low Earth orbit as other earlier Apollo missions had done to land on the moon. On 20 July 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin had done what some had thought was impossible. They walked on the moon. Five more Apollo missions followed in their footsteps, ending in 1972. From 1972 to present day, NASA has been going around and around in circles, never leaving low Earth orbit. That is, with humans on board. This ineptness, given the fact that NASA has a huge budget, has earned them the designation of NASA need another space agency within certain environments. Many believed it was inevitable since government agencies, especially without a grand goal, will become bloated and the employees within will always protect their pet projects rather than embrace the grand vision. The first grand vision is colonizing Mars as the pioneers in the past had tamed the West. There's not much time throughout my lifetime that I haven't been dreaming of a spacefaring civilization, but mostly it was dreaming because I could feel the sluggishness of the space program. But today, things are different. I can feel it. There seems to be a swell of interest in space 
that could be developing into an explosion of giant goals, new technologies, and a new future in space beyond low Earth orbit. I agree with our leader of the Mars Society, Robert Zubrin, when he quotes Victor Hugo. Armies cannot stop an idea whose time has come. And the time of settling the red planet has come. There will be a Musk High School, home of the red cyborgs, on Mars, no matter how many armies try to stop it. Now that the space program is gaining momentum, we can't take our foot off the gas pedal. As corporals in the Space Federation, we have to do everything we can, such as write our congressperson and surely NASA Chief Jim Bridenstine about pursuing humans to Mars immediately. Also, keep reminding the public that it is in our nature to explore. That's what humans do. Finally, to wrap things up, we need to discuss launching the manned missions from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Often the weather in Florida at the 58-year-old Complex 39 is temperamental. For this reason, in 1985, the Space Shuttle Enterprise was brought to California for fitting tests, but the launch date slipped months behind estimates. My brother and I were always at Edwards Air Force Base for the landings of the Space Shuttle, but we finally thought we were going to see a launch from Vandenberg. Sadly, astronauts were in training at Vandenberg when disaster struck. The catastrophic failure of the Space Shuttle Challenger in 1986 prompted a re-examining of engineering. The shuttle broke apart in the sky over Florida over a minute after takeoff. This sadly placed the crew of seven astronauts in the book of brave space pioneers who have given their lives for humans to finally leave this cradle called Earth. We will never forget those on that day, but the time has come for NASA to move west. There will be hardships along the way, and on Musk's plan to colonize Mars within the next dozen years, there will be lives lost. Maybe many lives, but the future does not belong to the timid. It belongs to the courageous. And one day, in the near future, we will be standing on Mars, staring out to space at a pale blue dot. And we will say what Victor Hugo had said over 150 years ago. Armies could not stop an idea whose time had come. Hi, this is Heidi Von Helmholtz from Alien Institute. Don't forget to subscribe, strike the like, comment, and share.